Purgatory, Chapter 22 Duration of Purgatory Opinions of the Doctors, Bellarmine Calculations of Father Mumford Faith does not teach us the precise duration of the pains of purgatory. We know in general that they are measured by divine justice, and that for each one they are proportioned to the number and gravity of the faults which he has not yet expiated. God may, however, without prejudice to his justice, abridge these sufferings by augmenting their intensity. The church militant also may obtain a remission by the holy sacrifices of the Mass and other suffrages offered for the departed. According to the common opinion of the doctors, the expiatory pains are of long duration. There is no doubt, says Bellarmine, that the pains of purgatory are not limited to ten and twenty years, and that they last in some cases entire centuries. But allowing it to be true that their duration did not exceed ten or twenty years, we can account it as nothing to have to endure for ten or twenty years the most excruciating sufferings without the least alleviation. If a man was assured that he should suffer some violent pain in his feet, or his head, or teeth for the space of twenty years, in that without ever sleeping or taking the least repose, would he not a thousand times rather die than to live in such a state? And if the choice were given him between a life thus miserable and the loss of all his temporal goods, should he hesitate to make the sacrifice of his fortune to be delivered from such a torment? Shall we then find any difficulty in embracing labor and penances to free ourselves from the sufferings of purgatory? Shall we fear practice the most painful exercises, vigils, fasts, almsgivings, long prayers, and especially contrition, accompanied with sighs and tears? These words comprise the whole doctrine of the saints and theologians. Father Mumford on the Company of Jesus in his treatise on charity towards the departed, bases the long duration of purgatory on a calculation of probability, which we shall give in substance. He goes out on the principle that, according to the words of the Holy Ghost, the just man falls seven times a day. That is to say, that even those who apply themselves most perfectly to the service of God, notwithstanding their good will, commit a great number of faults to the infinitely pure eyes of God. We have but to enter into our own consciences, and there analyze before God our thoughts, our words, and works, to be convinced of this sad effect of human misery. Oh, how easy it is to lack respect in prayer, to prefer our ease to the accomplishment of duty, to sin by vanity, by impatience, by sensuality, by uncharitable thoughts and words, by want of conformity to the will of God. The day is long, it is very difficult for even a virtuous person to commit, I do not say seven, but twenty or thirty of this kind of faults and imperfections. Let us take a moderate estimate and suppose that you commit about ten faults a day. At the end of 365 days, you will have the sum of 3,650 faults. Let us diminish, and to facilitate the calculation, place it at 3,000 per year. At the end of 10 years, this will amount be 30,000. At the end of 20 years, 60,000. Suppose that of these 60,000 faults, you have expiated one half by penance and good works there will still remain 30,000 to be atoned for. Let us continue our hypothesis. You die after these 20 years of virtuous life and appear before God with a debt of 30,000 faults, which you must discharge in purgatory. How much time will you need to accomplish this expiation? Suppose on average each fault requires one hour of purgatory. This measure is very moderate if you judge by the revelations of the saints. But at any rate, this will give you a purgatory of 30,000 hours. Now, do you know how many years these 30,000 hours represent? 
three years, three months, and fifteen days. Thus, a good Christian who watches over himself, who applies himself to penance and good works, finds himself liable to three years, three months, and fifteen days of purgatory. The preceding calculation is based on the estimate which is lenient in the extreme. Now if you extend the duration of the pain, and instead of an hour, you take a day for the expiation of a fault. If instead of having nothing but venial sins, you bring before God a debt resulting from mortal sin, more or less numerous, which you formerly committed, you will assign on the average, as St. Francis of Rome says, seven years for the expiation of one mortal sin, remitted as the guilt. Who does not see that we arrive at an appalling duration, and that the expiation may seem to be prolonged for many years, and even for centuries? Years and centuries of torments, oh, if we only thought of it, with what care we should avoid the least faults. With what fervor should we not practice penances to make satisfaction in this world? Purgatory, Chapter 23 Duration of Purgatory The Cistercian Abbot and Pope Innocent III John de Lieri In the life of St. Lograta, written by her contemporary, mention is made of a religious who otherwise was fervent but who, for an excess of zeal, was condemned to forty years of purgatory. This was an abbot of the Cistercian order, named Simon, who held St. Lograta in great veneration. The saint, on her part, willingly followed his advice, and in consequence a sort of spiritual friendship was formed between them. But the abbot was not as mild towards his subordinates as he was towards the saint. Severe with himself, he was also severe in his administration, and carried his exactions in matters of discipline even to harshness, forgetting the lesson of the divine master who teaches us to be meek and humble of heart. Having died, and while St. Lagrata was fervently praying, in imposing penances upon herself for the repose of his soul, he appeared to her and declared that he was condemned to forty years in purgatory. Fortunately, he had in La Grata a generous and powerful friend. She redoubled her prayers and austerities, and having received from God their assurance that the departed soul should soon be delivered, the charitable saint replied, I will not cease to importune your mercy until I see him freed from his pains. Since I am mentioning St. Lagrata, ought I to speak of the celebrated apparition of Pope Innocent III? I acknowledge the pursual of this incident shocked me, and I would fain pass it over in silence. I was reluctant to think that a pope, and such a pope, had been condemned to so long and terrible a purgatory. We know that Innocent III, who presided at the celebrated Council of Lateran in 1215, was one of the greatest pontiffs who ever filled the chair of St. Peter. His piety and zeal led him to accomplish great things from the Church of God and holy discipline. How then admit that such a man was judged with so great severity at the Supreme Tribunal? How reconcile this revelation? of St. Lagarta with divine mercy? I wished, therefore, to treat it as an illusion, and sought for reasons to support of this idea, but I found, on the contrary, that the reality of this apparition is admitted by the gravest authors, and that it is not rejected by a single one. Moreover, the biographer Thomas de Contemporary is very explicit, and at the same time very reserved. Remark, dear reader, he writes at the end of his narrative, that it was from the mouth of the pious Lagrata herself that I heard of the faults revealed by the defunct, in which I admit here through the respect of so great a pope. Aside from this, considering the events in itself, can we find any good reason for calling it into question? Do we not know that God makes no exceptions of persons? 
that the popes appear before his tribunal like the humblest of the faithful, that all the greatest and the lowliest are equal before him, and that each one receives according to his works? Do we not know that those who govern others have a greater responsibility and will have to render a severe account? A most severe judgment shall be for them that bear rule. Wisdom 6.6 6. It is the Holy Ghost that declares it. Now Innocent III reigned for eighteen years and during most turbulent times, and added the Volantis, is not written that the judgments of God are inscrutable and often very different from the judgments of men? The reality of this apparition cannot, then, be reasonably called into question. I see no other reason for admitting it, since God does not reveal mysteries of this nature for any other purpose than that, that they should be made known for the edification of his church. Pope Innocent III died July 16, 1216. The same day he appeared to St. Lagrata in her monastery at Arreras in Brabant. Surprised to see a specter enveloped in flames, she asked who he was and what he wanted. I am Pope Innocent, he replied. Is it possible that you, our common father, should be in such a state? It is but too true. I am expiating three faults which have caused my eternal perdition. Thanks to the Blessed Virgin Mary, I have obtained pardon for them, but I have to make atonement. Alas, it is terrible, and it will last for centuries if you do not come to my assistance. In the name of Mary, who obtained from me the favor of appealing to you, help me. With these words he disappeared. La Grada announced the Pope's death to her sisters, and together they betook themselves to prayer and penitential works in behalf of the august and venerated pontiff, whose demise was communicated to them some weeks later from another source. Let us add here a more consoling fact, which we find in the life of the same saint. A celebrated preacher named John de Lieri was a man of great piety and well known to our saint. He had made a contract with her by which they mutually promised that one should die first, with the permission of God, should appear to the other. John was the first to depart this life, having undertaken a journey to Rome for the arrangement of a certain affairs in the interest of the religious. He met his death among the Alps. Faithful to his promise, he appeared to Lagrada in the celebrated cloister of Arrears. On seeing him, the saint had not the slightest idea that he was dead and invited him, according to the rule, to enter the parlor that he might converse with him. And I am no more of this world, he replied, and I come here only in fulfillment of my promise. At these words, La Grada fell on her knees and remained there for some time quite confounded. Then raising her eyes to her blessed friend, why, she said, are you clothed in such splendor? What does this triple robe signify with which I see you adorned? The white garment, he replied, signifies virginal purity in which I have always preserved. The red tunic implies the labors and sufferings which have prematurely exhausted my strength. And the blue mantle which covers all denotes the perfection of the spiritual life. Having said these words, he suddenly left Lograda, who remained divided between regret for having lost so good a father, and the joy she experienced on account of his happiness. St. Vincent Ferrer, the celebrated wonder worker of the Order of St. Dominic, who preached with so much eloquence the great truth of the judgment of God, had a sister who remained unmoved either by word or by example by her saintly brother. She was full of the spirit of the world, intoxicated with its pleasures, and walked with rapid strides towards her eternal ruin. Meanwhile, the saint prayed for her conversion, and his prayers were finally answered. The unfortunate sinner fell mortally sick, and at the moment of death entered into herself and made her confession with sincere repentance. 
Some days after her death, whilst her brother was celebrating the holy sacrifice, she appeared to him in the midst of flames, in a prey of the most intolerable torments. Alas, my dear brother, she said, I am condemned to undergo these torments until the last day of judgment, unless you assist me. The efficacy of the holy sacrifice is so great. Offer for me about thirty masses, and I may hope the happiest result. The saint hastened to accede to her request. He celebrated thirty masses, and on the thirtieth day his sister again reappeared to him surrounded by angels and soaring to heaven. Thanks to the virtue of the divine sacrifice, an expiation of several centuries was reduced to thirty days. This example shows us at once the duration of the pains which a soul may incur and the powerful effect of the holy sacrifice of the Mass when God is pleased to apply it to a soul. But this application, like all other suffrages, do not always take place, at least not always in the same plentitude.